Welcome to today's webinar, and our webinar is entitled Making the Case for Information Management, What You Need to Know to Prove Value, Remove Risks, and Save Money. Um, I'm Teresa Resick, Vice President of Education here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And the point is our underwriter, and we thank them very much for their support. And certainly thank you for taking the time to join us today. And these two always make our webinars and make learning fun. And I'm so pleased to have these folks uh, from AppPoint with us. Alyssa Blackburn, who's the Director of Information Management, and Bruce Behrens, who's the Senior Solutions Engineer and of Product Strategy. So let me turn things over to Alyssa and thank you. Again, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a really cool topic that I am really looking forward to, to getting into with everybody today. Um, for those of you who haven't um, met us, uh, my name's Alyssa Blackburn. I'm AppPoint's Director of, of Information Management Strategy, and I recently accidentally hugged my child's teacher. Um, and now I'm going to have to leave the country because I'm so embarrassed that I can, um, my children are going to have to change schools, all kinds of things. So um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that story as we as we go. I am joined, as always, by my incredible colleague, um, Bruce Behrens. Bruce, how did you break your friend's butt? So this, this story may not be as exciting as people were hoping, but um, <laughs> I do martial arts um, and I, I currently do karate. Uh, one of my long-term, I suppose, sparring partners decided that they didn't want to block a kick uh, as well as they should, so they now had a have a broken coccyx. So, yes. <laughs> I think broken butt sounds so much more better um, than the. Um, yeah. But you well, know, yours well, is yours is technically but, accurate, so we can go with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, to say. Um, you know, we've all done embarrassing things. So um, we <laughs> work from we work for um, AppPoint. AppPoint is um, an independent software vendor. One of the incredible pieces of software that we make is our information management and our information lifecycle solution. We're not we're not talking so much about that. Um, we're not talking so much about that today. We're really going to talk more about. A business case and and more the the process of information management absolutely do keep those um do keep those questions coming i think you can use either the q a um as Teresa said we'll get that hopefully we'll get the the chat working as well we are also going to make this interactive um so we um we have we're going to use um a, a little tool called slido you can either just go to slido.com and and punch in this number or you can scan that QR code. Um, you can scan that QR code on the screen there with your smartphone, um, and you'll be able to you'll be able to answer questions, and we'll be able to see everybody's responses live as they come through. They're all anonymous. We're not. Um, we don't. That doesn't collect any of your information. Only the answers. Only the answers that you put in. So as long as you don't put your name or you know phone number or um, credit card details in there, please don't do that. Um, it's all all completely all completely anonymous. So we'll have a bit of fun with we'll have a bit of fun with Slido today and we'll we'll get some get some great feedback from from everybody on that one. So let's let's launch straight into it. People have already, um, started. <laughs> people have already started. Go, yeah. go people. That's right. Um so how much data just just this just just a you know a bit of a, a straw poll, a bit of a straw poll here. Um how much data do you think is um is created every day? 2.25 uh trillion megabytes, 1.14. They keep moving. They're 1.14 trillion megabytes. I lost count after the 10th zero. That was me, definitely. Um 11 billion megabytes or 225 billion megabytes we've got some good got some good responses here definitely i think that um i think that we are um i think that what we're saying here regardless of regardless of what the actual number is what we're saying is good grief there is a lot of of information and data created on a on a daily basis so we're really talking about we're really talking about huge numbers here 
And when we're talking about these huge numbers, we have to really be talking about different strategies for being, being able to manage it. And again, when we've got this much content, look, honestly, whether it's 2.25 trillion or 1.14 trillion or 225 billion, actually it doesn't even matter anymore. What we're what we're talking about is just a, a, a monumental figure here that needs to be managed. And so we're talking about an incredibly important asset that we need to make, that we really need to make a solid business case for in selling the, the value of, of the management of this, of the management of this information. So we'll close this one down now. Thank you to all of you who have who have entered in there. We're going to have some more as we as we go through. So definitely stay, um, definitely stay engaged. Um, definitely stay engaged with that for sure. But let's um let's look at let's look at um, some actual some some more solid figures about yeah. about what we're about what we're creating here so uh, as Alyssa kind of uh, alluded to content's growing at an exponential rate especially in cloud solutions so the more information that is in these repositories is the more information that we need to manage so from a Microsoft standpoint over 300 million monthly active users are using teams at the moment so and that was as of April 2023, which is an increase on a, from, I think it was 270 million the year before. Um, this one's a real interesting statistic, which is around 47% of workers find can't find the information that they need to do their job in an easy, efficient way, um, which obviously leads to, to cost increases and things like that, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the next one is is quite an interesting st statistic. Um, on on average, globally, every human creates about 1.7 megabytes of data every second. Um, so it, it is a lot of data that we're creating at the moment. And finally, we have um, an estimation around of around uh, 200 zettabytes of data that is expected to be stored in cloud infrastructure by 2025. So. Uh, I don't know if that's been revised uh, due to COVID recently and obviously everyone moving to remote systems, um, but um, yeah, quite a lot of information, quite a lot of data being posted in those cloud solutions. Okay. So we're talking about, we really are talking about a huge, a huge amount of content here. So let's go back to Slido, let's go back to you. Um, I also think I just saw in the chat, we've got another Aussie on the call. Oh my goodness. We've got another 4 a.m. on the call. Woo. Um, but where, <laughs> wherever you are from, um, definitely welcome. So let's talk about, let's talk about the, um, the, the risks. We've got just this monumental amount of, of data. Um, what's the biggest risk? That's associated with that. You could that could be things like um, you could you could consider security, which is one that we've got here. The, um, what you'll see on Slido as well is that the more people who type the same thing, the words will get bigger. So so we'll kind of get a, a lovely word picture of um, of what this looks like. Dollars, yeah, totally agree, totally agree on the dollars one. Definitely hackers. My goodness, that is such a good one. I um I definitely, and I think that we saw yesterday, Bruce, I think you showed me yesterday, there's been another really significant data breach. Um, mm -hmm. Who was that? Who was that with? Uh, I don't think it's been confirmed yet, but there was mention that Sony was one of the ones. Oh, was... Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure we'll hear, I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the next couple of days. Definitely difficult to find. And I think I, I absolutely losing important content over the long term. Don't know where all that information is. Efficiency, things like that. These absolutely, I couldn't agree more with every every one of these. I think that these are these are really significant risks. And I think what comes with the one I'm I'm interested in in this one is. Um, you know, no, don't know where all the information is, too hard to find, things like that. What we're really at risk of, um, look at all those, like, look, um, what we're really at risk of here is poor decision making and the inability to make 
decent decisions because we don't have access to the information that we need. So when we make information too hard to find or there's too much of it, it's just impossible to make good decisions. So just recently, actually last week, actually, I um, I had a week of um, time off, which was lovely. And um, I took my children to Sydney for a week and we went to the Blue Mountains, um, which, you know, if you're in the area, I know some of you might be a bit far away, but if you ever happen to be in the area highly recommend um uh, but we ended up down in a in a rainforest um which was um 270 meters from we were, so we were down 270 meters which what did we say that was in i yards? don't know how many blue whales that is and it was something it's a like 14 blue whales or something yeah. um anyway it's filled with trees absolutely packed with trees and if you had said to me Alyssa go and find this particular tree in this just absolutely enormous rainforest what is my what are my chances of actually being able to find that tree that they're non-existent absolutely non-existent because the sheer volume around me was just way way too much and this is exactly the same thing that our users are struggling with because we've got this enormous volume of content that they just can't they can't find anything to be able to to be able to make to be able to make those good decisions. We've got some absolutely fantastic answers on here. Thanks so much for your for your contribution. And I think what you'll see as we go through this as well is that you know you're not alone in this. You know, people are people are feeling the same things and and um, you know having these having these same challenges. I think so we need to call out. I think we need to call out mental health as as a as a good response to. Oh what's yeah, the absolutely. This associated with all this content because I agree. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly with that one. Absolutely. Did you know actually there was a, a news article? I'll see if I can dig up the link for it while we're while we're on here. But there was a news article recently about the mental health issues that um, information hoarding and data hoarding has, and they're actually starting to do some studies on it now about relating it to to actual physical hoarding and the mental health issues that are associated with that, and and how that can be really quite overwhelming for people. So I think that that's a I think that that's a really um, a really Solid significant yeah. a really significant thing. So, all right, let's let's keep going though. But great answers on there, everybody. Thank you so thank you so much for that. Essentially, what we're looking at here is if we are not managing our active content, so the the content that everybody's using every day, this is essentially what our this is essentially what our workplace is looking like, and that's just absolutely absolutely something that we don't want. So what some of the options that we've had, and this is particularly something that a lot of organisations are, are uh, struggling with at the moment is, okay, well, we'll get things out of the active repository and we'll just put it into, we'll put it into an archive or we'll put it into cheaper storage or we'll just move it, we'll just move it over there. But essentially this is the problem that we're creating. So regardless of where we are storing our content, um, this huge, huge volume of content. The key is lifecycle management. It doesn't matter where that content is. Is it in an inactive repository? Is it an active repository? Things like that. It still needs to be managed. And we're essentially, what we're essentially saying is if we, trans, if we translate that to the, to the physical world, we're essentially saying we've hoarded our, our house, so now we're going to go and buy a, a storage container down the road. It's a little bit cheaper, but we're going to fill that up and then we're going to do another one and then we're going to do another one. We're not actually not actually solving the problem. The, the, key to solving the, the key to solving the problem is life cycle management. Now, I know that you all agree with that. Um, and uh, um, John in the chat, thank you so much. Information should flow like a river, not stored up like in a dam. Yes, I love that analogy. That's absolutely, totally, totally agree with that. We're not going to talk so much about life cycle management because I think, you know, I don't think anybody disagrees, although, you know, feel free to argue with me. I think, you know, that'd be interesting. Um, but what I want to do is, is transition to talking about um, how we make the case for the importance of life cycle management in our organization. Um, and if you have heard me 
talk before, which some of you may have, you know I love a story. You know I love a good story. And, and don't worry, we are going to finish on a story today, I promise. Um, but um, I think that stories are one of the best ways that we can communicate value. So what I want to do today is when we're talking about making this business case, we're talking about communicating value, I'm going to share a few stories with you about how we can do this um, and, and using some real life examples of where things didn't go very well. So that's how we're that's how we're going to work through this. And then we can talk a little bit at the end about how we transition this, how we transition this into a into a business case. So we've got all of these problems. We've got all of these these issues, and we saw a lot of these. We saw a lot of these in the Slido before. That it's really translating to, you know, potentially we could be looking at fines for, um, you know, for for lack of lack of compliance and fines. I would say we've got to stop thinking about it in terms of fines for, oh, I just didn't meet this particular piece of very specific information management legislation. But fines could come in all kinds of different ways. Fines could come as a result of, you know, poor decision making, for example. Um, and it could come under really any kind of any kind of legal environment because we didn't have access to the right information. So if we stop thinking about, oh, well, if you, you know, breach this one particular you know, if you have a breach in this one particular space, you can have a breach in any kind of particular space. What it actually comes down to is the fundamental issue of it was an information management failure. We also talk about loss of productivity, and that's really closely aligned with user frustration. And I'll give you some good, give you some good stuff with that as well. All of this, of course, can lead to reputational damage and poor decision making. And actually, I think that poor decision making is probably the biggest risk that we've got here because we're so reliant on the information that we have to be able to make good decisions what happens when we can't access the what happens when we can't access the information and then finally we'll talk about cost so one of i think the really interesting things about our transition to more cloud based storage and and cloud systems is that kind of had this idea that this is all endless and you know it was forever and we could just you know as, as are the clouds, this, you know, this storage was endless, but it turns out that wasn't quite the case at all. There is an end, there is an end, to, well, there's not necessarily an end to storage, but there's really a, an enormous cost to that. And we know that a number of organisations are, are really feeling the pressure of that, of the cost of storing this information, particularly in a in a cloud world, so we'll have a look at some have a look at some examples of um, of of what that looks like, but also how we as information managers can actually return really substantial cost savings to an organisation just through lifecycle management. So, what are we looking for? What are we looking for here? Really, when we're making the case for information management, we really want to look for three success outcomes so and if we can if we can narrow it down these of course there's lots of different um lots of different things that come out of all of these but if we have three um if we can narrow it down to three things and and bundle these together i would say that we're talking about integrity efficiency and cost savings so integrity i would bundle things like risk and compliance and um, reputational damage and um, ability to make good decisions and things like that and i would say that that's both for the integrity of our organization but also for the integrity of our information so that's integrity efficiency is about how can we make it easier for users to do their jobs and cost is literally let's see how we can let's see how we can save some money on this so they're the three focus areas that we're going to that we're going to look at we're going to look at today I found this. I found this quote uh, from E.O. Wilson, who's actually a, uh, a famed biologist, which I definitely knew um, before oh, well, I went searching for these the quotes. Most Bruce and I expert on ants. Yes, on ants. That's exactly yeah. right. Bruce and I had a big argument when I put this when I put this slide in because he said I didn't know who this guy was, and I said I absolutely did know who this guy was, and then we both. <laughs> We both spent several hours Googling this guy and we know more about ants than, than we possibly should. But anyway, I think that the quote stands though. Um, and that is that we're drowning information while starving for, for wisdom. 
the world henceforth will be run by synthesizers, people who are able to put together the right information at the right time, think, think critically about it and make important choices, um, make important choices wisely. We are the synthesizers. And I think that's a really, I think that's a really lovely way of, of describing our role in this as the synthesizers of all of this, of this drowning of, of information to allow people to be able to access the right information at the right time, think, think critically about it and, and um, make important um, choices wisely. And I think that that's a really, I think that that's a really, um, a really powerful, really powerful message there, definitely. Okay, so let's go back into let's go back into Slido. Hopefully, the if you if you have um, you can scan that QR code at um, um, any time. Um, but what does information integrity actually mean to you? What does what when you look at something like information integrity? What do you what do you think? Trustworthy? I think yes, absolutely. Accuracy? Or oh, like that one for sure. Um, reliable? Yep. Um, authenticity? Authentic and reliable? Truth? Chain of custody? Yes, that's a really good one as well because we can't forget that that information integrity comes from process and and not to say that we should have process for the sake of process but this is where this is where this comes from is is the ability to have really solid process of which definitely chain of chain of custody is one informed decision making uh, metadata version control yes absolutely totally agree with all of this Love i think we're idea. definitely getting it <laughs> Um, definitely getting a, 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 a vibe here on, on authentic, accurate, trustworthy, um, identifying evidence to support your decision. Um, oh, distillation. Oh, I like that one. I think that's really, I think that's really good. I think that's absolutely, that's absolutely correct. Completeness. Um, yeah, lots of lots of really good, lots of really good things here, definitely. So um I think that information integrity is one of those things that I um that I bang on about all the time because I just think I think it's so critical to I think it's so critical to what we do. Um and and making the the business case. Um, you know, including that as part of a business case, I should say, is one of those, is one of those really, one of those really important things. Definitely useful. Oh, I just saw useful pop up. I think that's, that's a sensational answer there as well. It has to be useful. It has to be usable. I think that, that it has to be available. Really, really great responses here. I think that, um, I think that these are all absolutely, absolutely accurate. All right. We'll move on. We'll move on to that. Thank you again for your um, thank you again for your responses in that. So let's have a look at some. Let's have a look at some actual stories and let's have a look at some actual examples. And sometimes what we need in our organisations is to maybe even go back within within our organisation and be able to you know be able to look at maybe where some of these um, say suboptimal uh, things have have happened. But one of the examples that I want to give, and these are all everything that I'm giving you is is from publicly available publicly available sources but I, I want to give the example of um pg and e and just this is one of the many uh fines that they received from uh, um the san bruno blast that happened I, I think in about 2008 one of the um amongst many issues of this and this is a this is a really significant this is a really significant thing that happened here but uh, essentially, a um, a gas pipeline under the the town of um, San Bruno failed, and caused a, a massive explosion, which um, killed eight people, destroyed thirty eight homes. It was really, it was really, really significant, and the consequences are are extremely tragic. When we go back to look at some of the causation for this, though. Um, some of the evidence shows that um, pg and &E had lost the maintenance records for this particular pipeline. So it hadn't been maintained in many, many, many years um, because they didn't have access to the information that they needed to be able to make good decisions. 
And unfortunately, the result of that was this really enormously tragic event because they, they you know, they didn't maintain the pipeline because, you know, didn't really know that it was there. Now, there's, there was a whole bunch of other stuff. This is, I'm, I'm picking out one, one small component of this that I think illustrates this point really well. Um, but they were, um, they were fined quite significantly. They weren't fined necessarily under any kind of records management legislation or things like that. What they actually got fined over was safety records and, and essentially their lack of records. Um, so it's more, it's more than just about meeting particular meeting particular regulations, although that's really important because the regulations are there for a reason, we need to be looking at this about risk reduction and non-compliance can result not only in serious reputational damage, but also tragic loss of life. So nine, eight people are no longer here today because the, the records were not there to be able to make that, to be able to make that decision. This is one example, and I can see as well that um, there's um, that this is being used in, a, in an exam um, sample question. And also, um, Heather, I see you was using this example as well when when teaching about records management. Um, it's such a good it's such a good example, most most definitely um, that um, um, I think that, um, oh gosh, I've just completely lost my train of thought. Um, but this is one that shows, this is one that shows that it doesn't matter that it hasn't come under a particular, um, it doesn't It doesn't matter that it hasn't come under a particular um, um, information management or records management piece of legislation that um, you can go to back through your organization you can look for other examples and things like that to be able to say this is the value of information management we need to you know we need to do this for risk reduction and things like that i can see another question in uh, the q a which is uh, are there any more recent examples so another example there are absolutely there are examples everywhere for this and another example i'll give you of that is this is an australian example it's just one that's sort of popped into my head at the the um at the minute um, in Australia, there was a, a program um, recently about um, collecting uh, social security debt. Um, so where it was believed that people who were on social security owed a debt to the government about collecting those. The system that they implemented, though, um, it came to be known as robo debt. Uh, but the system they implemented wasn't able to read any kind of unstructured data. So if, if somebody had submitted, for example, um, an employment separation certificate to say that I am no longer employed and that's why I'm applying for, for social security, um, it, the system wasn't able to read that. So it would raise a debt, and these debts turned out to be very, very significant, it would raise a debt against this person to say, well, you haven't given us the right information. That led to huge amount of, of turmoil for people who are already incredibly vulnerable and, and very, very tragically led to a number of suicides um, for very, very vulnerable people in Australia who had an incorrect debt raised against them because the system wasn't processing this unstructured data. Now, again, because that system didn't have access to the right information, we can see a flow on effect of all of these, of all of these different things um, that, um, you know, result in, in an unimaginable tragedy for the people who are affected by this. We, do, we don't want to be in that position when we have the information to be able to make, to be able to make um, better, better decisions. So if you've got some examples or some that, you know, you're happy to share, I can see one that has just been, um, had just been shared now, which I, as another one I think is, um, is a really good example of that. Please share them in the chat as well, because I think everybody benefits from understanding, um, understanding these these stories as well. So I've got some articles coming out um, that if you follow me on LinkedIn, um, please, please get in touch with LinkedIn. I love, love being connected with people there. Um, I've got some more stories coming out um, in some articles that I've um, contributed to and am, am writing over the, the coming weeks. So, so this is a, this is a, a big one as well. 
you will get these slides at the end as well, just to be clear. So I'm not going to go through this. I'm, I'm conscious of conscious of time and, and how much more information I want to share with you. Um, uh, and so, but there's some other examples here about, um, you know, holding on to information for the wrong periods of time and, and some of the fines that, that organisations are receiving for, for these information management, information management failures. Bruce, do you want to talk? Do you want to talk about? I've given you about thirty-five seconds to talk about. That's okay. Efficiency and productivity. That's all good. That's fine. So, I suppose the key thing with efficiency and productivity is: it, are we making it easy for users to do their jobs, and making it easy for them to do the right thing? Ultimately, is what it comes down to. So, in a lot of scenarios, especially in in the modern workplace where we've got lots of cloud solutions that people are using. There are ways that we can automate that as, as much as we like, but I'm interested to understand how long you spend looking for something before you give up on it. And this kind of goes back to that an original 47% of people can't find the information that they need to do their job. Oh, <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's a, I love that. That's the first one because me. I'm, I personally am 100% in the less than a minute camp. If I cannot, if I cannot find it really quickly, like, you know, using, you know, using search or, or where I think it, it would have been stored or things like that. My, my limits usually, usually about 45 seconds, definitely before I'll be like, no, no, so clearly it's lost, but what that means for me is if I can't find it in less than that one minute, being the wildly impatient, um, wildly impatient person that I am, I will usually just go and recreate something, which is then, of course, a complete waste of my time. Because perhaps if I, you know, if I up my limit to to thirty minutes, um, you know, maybe I would have had maybe I would have had more of a chance of finding it. Let's but on the clear, other side, you of do that, usually ask me if you can't find it too. Yeah, I do, 100%. So that's at, the, <laughs> that's at about the 45-second mark where I then transition where I then transition the task to you so, <laughs> and make you find things for me. So um, I, think, I think I've got some of my colleagues on the, who are on, the, who are on our um, joining us today who are, like, making mental notes. If Alyssa asks you to find something, block her on... Um, <laughs> Her on you know what? I am somewhat heartened. <laughs> I am what somewhat heartened that no one has gone with the I don't bother starting because it's usually hopeless. Yeah, so I know. That's, that's a good thing. That is <laughs> Oh, oh no, Maya just blocked me. I knew that was coming though, Maya. Um, I love that there's we've been given an alternate option here is, is I will die in seeking its truth, um, which I love. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. And you're absolutely right. We have a group of information management people here, definitely. So I do think that there's, I do think that there's a, um, uh, you know, we are more committed, are more committed to the cause definitely on, on that one. Cool. So how do we, how can we make things or what, what, what is efficiency all about when it comes to end users? So just a statistic here that users can lose up to 10 hours a week looking for, or as Alyssa mentioned, recreating content that they cannot find. Um, and that obviously, as we've discussed, leads to a risk of poor decisions being made because of the information that is in there and because there is no a lack of access to that good information. Um, and quite simply, users don't want to be records managers or information managers. And, and a lot of solutions that are on the market these days are all about taking the burden away from, from end users um, and, and ensuring that, that records management and information management is done in an automated way. So the next thing to look at is cost. So how much can money can you save through good information management? And there's a couple of key things here, but the, the, the main one here is around storage costs and storage optimization. So um, we've got a Slido next, which is all about if you're using cloud storage, um, how close are you to reaching your capacity limits at the moment of that cloud storage? This can be, you can just put in, you don't need to put in a percentage or anything here. One of your answers could be, no idea. There you go. Um, 
Um, so definitely one of your answers. Um, you know, if you if you're not aware, then then say like that's not you know that's not a um, not an issue at all. Um, uh, Eric, I noticed you you were looking for a link to the McKinsey study. I, um, I can't put my hands on the link. I have it, yes, um, but it might be something that we could send as as part of the follow up. I might actually um, I might even um, include a link in the in the PowerPoint deck that we'll share. So I'll make sure that we can definitely can make sure that we can get that one for you. No one has said anything yet. That's, that's okay. That's we just have to one. pay more. Yeah. Um, so um more importantly i don't know when or how it can happen for, for upcoming pre in which repository yes <laughs> that's a that's an excellent excellent one definitely so um i think that i think there's some really i think that there's some really interesting interesting stuff here this is probably one of the things in in all seriousness that organizations like that this is the thing that people want to talk to me about yeah. at the moment um which is um help, 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 we're so far over our storage capacity that, and this is where, this is where sort of IT starts to get involved and say, well, it's okay, well, and then we'll just move, we'll just move everything to a, um, just move everything to an archive kind of thing, but then we lose, potentially lose control of it and things like that, which is a really serious, which is a really serious issue. So um, let's have a look at, um, let's have a look at actual potential cost savings yeah so hanging on to too much data can also be equally as expensive as not hanging on to enough data such as the fines that we were talking about before so just some of the figures that you can see on the screen here um the the first one around the 350 to 525k yeah, basically 50 to, with this organization 50 to 75 percent of reviewed emails were found to have no uh, retention value and the company paid that amount to review all the records that basically had no value that were in there um the 6.2 million around a major energy company they said that it would take uh six months and a cost of 6.2 million to do a discovery process across their information to even identify sensitive information um the and you know the 2.1 million there around uh, organizations that's what they lose are on average because of of poor data management uh, systems or poor data management practices in, in general across across the environment. So if we jump to the next slide, where ultimately there are substantial cost benefits to implementing good information life cycles. So we spoke about the 200 plus setabytes before. That is estimated to be in infrastructure by 2025. The amount of bytes, and there's your answer to that initial question that, that we asked, the amount of bytes uh, that are being used or created each day is, is excessive. Um, and there are limits to cloud storage. So I noticed before that someone mentioned that cloud storage is cheap. It is cheap until you get to a point where you've hit limits and you need to start paying a lot more for it. And yes, it can be cheaper than on-premises and, and things like that but there is substantial costs around it. So the key, I suppose, outcome here is to implement good information lifecycle, you know, robust retention and disposal processes to ensure that you're not keeping the content that you don't need to keep beyond its, its, its I suppose, need or value. Um, and then also archiving the content to cheaper tiers of storage potentially as well that you're not actually using. And that's, you know, kind of cleaning up your environment for your end users as well so that they're not getting you know, a face full of, of content that's really not that valid to them or really not that important to them because it it, it should be in an archive or, or out of their purview. I see also some people making comments as well um, for, um, you know, AI is going to solve all of our problems and things like that. And, and um, I, you know, I certainly agree with the, the sentiment of the, of the message of the message there. Um, we're actually going to, we're actually going to run um, a second webinar. Um, I think at the end of, I think it's the end of October, Teresa will be able to give you the thing, but we're actually going to talk about how I can help solve some of these challenges, but also what it's not. So, um, so we need to, um, we'll, we'll be doing a follow-up one on, on how AI fits into, into all of this. Okay, 
moving along a couple of things to go we're getting um getting close to being able to wrap up but i want to give you an opportunity to ask some any other questions if you if you can we've gone through some stories as well um you know to talk about how we how we show how we can show this value but how do we translate this into an actual how do we translate this into an actual business case so, so just ideas here about making sure that we align this to the, the strategy of the organisation. How does this fit into this? And while we may not get a project up on its own, where can we slot in with something else? You know, is there other things going on in the organisation that can that this could potentially um, align to? Looking at an options analysis, definitely, and consequences. What happens if you do nothing? So what can we what can we do in that place? We have to be really clear in what happens when we, you know, that if we do this, this is going to be the outcome. But also, if we don't do this, this is going to be the com um, going to be the um, the consequences. The cost is we want to look at that from both sides as well. And that is what is it going to cost us to do this, but also what is it going to save? So a lot of the organisations that I'm working with at the moment are saying to me, I don't have budget for this. This project is going to have to have to pay for itself. So, for example, if we do move things to cheaper storage, that's great. But that the, the, has to that has to fund it, and how do we do that in a way that we can still maintain the oversight of the information, even though it's been moved to an IT archive? And then the last one is about how we're going to implement this. So what's required to actually get it going? And even more importantly, how will we know it's been successful? So this is an area that I see a lot of organisations fall down in, is understanding their success criteria um, and, and being able to then to measure, to say, yes, this has been, yes, this has been successful um, because we've, we've got these measurable, we've got these measurable outcomes. Um, we might skip this one because we are we're running we are running up on time because in a shocking turn of events I have talked too much and I did want to finish I did want to finish on a on a story today but I wanted to tell you a story of two birthday cakes um so I have a deal with my children that for their birthdays I will make them a cake of any flavor any kind of shape or you know character or, or things like that and I'm not too bad at it I am nowhere I am absolutely nowhere professional but I'm not I'm not too bad for an amateur I'm an, an amateur baker but sometimes things don't go according to plan and I'm going to show you the story or I'm going to show you a picture of one of the cakes that I made for my daughter who asked for a cake in the shape of a mermaid tail. And I'm going to ask you to pop in the chat, what do you think this looks like? Because I'm telling you right now, does not look like a mermaid tail. <laughs> and so pop in a frog. <laughs> That's much nicer. Um, much nicer than what I thought it was. A body with no arms. Yes, yes, agree. Um, agree with that. Definitely a heart with legs. Oh, I like that. That's much nicer than what I said it was. Um, but here's where I went wrong with this cake. So first of all, she wanted a red velvet cake, which was fine. Um, but... And so a red velvet cake off obviously is served with cream cheese icing, which is like the best part of the cake. Um, but piping cream cheese icing is really difficult. You would need to really, you really want to use a buttercream for that. So I had the genius idea, um, an absolute genius idea of I added some gelatin to the cream cheese icing to make it a little bit more solid. But clearly, clearly that did not, did not work. Now she still liked the cake. I love this picture because I can look back on it and remember how, how hilarious it is um, or how hilarious it was. And I, I certainly certainly don't think it ever looks like a mermaid tail um, I think your um your comments in the chat are much much kinder than what I said it looked like but um my next daughter who was um was born um two weeks after my first daughter with a four-year gap in between just to, if anyone's wondering there she because her the big sister had a mermaid tail cake the little sister also had to have a mermaid tail cake 
And so this was my second attempt at the, this was my second attempt at the mermaid tail cake where I took my learnings from the first. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw Andrea, I just saw your, your comment in the chat and love it, nailed it. Perfect use of Australian slang there, definitely. But in my second attempt at the cake, I think we can all agree this looks much, much better than the than the first mermaid, the first mermaid um, attempt because I took what I learned from my first um, from my first effort. I applied it to my second effort. So how can we relate this? How on earth do I relate learnings from cake back to information management? A couple of things. Just because the cake didn't work out as I intended doesn't mean the work was wasted. So when we think about making the case or trying to sell the value or things like that, it might not, our first attempt may not have worked in the way that we wanted to, or even our second attempt or even our third attempt or things like that. But it doesn't mean that what we did was wasted. If I go back to, if I go back to this one, there was still cake. We still ate cake. The cake actually tasted quite delicious looked terrible but it 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 tasted um it tasted really good it wasn't wasted I learned from it point number two between cake one and cake two I learned some really valuable lessons and I and I got better so when I'm selling the value of information in the organization maybe it doesn't work the way I wanted it to the first time or or things like that or maybe I didn't get everything that I wanted but the next time I do it I'm better informed. I know a little bit more. I change, you know, I change what needs to be changed. I changed from a, a cream cheese icing to a buttercream icing. I changed from a tried to do a great big massive cake into doing a into doing a cupcake. I changed from trying to sculpt the things myself to using a chocolate mold, things like that. Um, and at the end, there was still cake. At the end, we have still achieved something. We have still moved the needle. We've, we're still on that journey kind of thing. We've still got stuff that we've either learned something from or, uh, you know, that we can take forward, we can take forward into the future. So while it can definitely feel like an uphill battle at times to get, to get some of this across the line and to get some of this, to get some of this done, it's not going to waste. Your work is incredibly valuable. It is, it is extremely important. So continue to fight that, that good fight. Continue to make that case can, or, or, or cake. Um, see what I did there. Um, you know, continue to. <laughs> I haven't even had any it's coffee too early. It's too early. It's too early. I know. This. And I haven't, you know, I'm, I think 5 a.m. is what I can, is what I can finally start drinking coffee for sure. So, um, so yeah, so that's how, that's how message at that message for you today is remember at the end, there is still, there is still cake. The work that you have done is, is valuable learn from it, improve, get better, um, things like things like that. We do have some resources here. You can scan these QR codes um, and, and download those straight away, but they will be, um, uh, Teresa will pop some links in there for you as well. We've left, we've left you with a couple of minutes um, at the end to, to um, please throw any questions on, um, on anything that we've, we've talked about today or, you know, my red velvet cake recipe, happy to share that too. Um, but yeah, if you do have questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll um, we'll try and answer those in the few minutes that we have left. In hindsight, I'm feeling that we missed an opportunity to not name the webinar the business cake for information. Management. The business cake, I know we totally, yeah. we totally yeah. I can't I can't believe we missed that one. So <laughs> yeah. we should have named the next one the ingredients for good AI. Wow. See? <laughs> not too late to change. No, true, true, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa, I, I nominate your your need for caffeine for re-energizing our audience members today. <laughs> Just to mention what some people have been putting in here of how much they're enjoying this this talk today. Um, yes, the the QR codes that are up on the screen, the 
um, I also have those same links in that URL, that resources link that I've been sharing out there. So um, multiple ways to get a hold of this really cool content uh, that Alyssa and Bruce have been sharing. Um, a PDF of this of this slide deck is also um, linked in uh, the resources URL that I've been sharing. I also dropped a link in there as Alyssa reminded me. Um, we have another webinar with them coming up next month, October 25th. And so I put the link to uh, that a webinars registration page in the chat. So um, you get to hear some more really good stuff from these folks. And and um, do please, if you have more questions, please keep you know, popping them in the chat. Um, Gabrielle very kindly pulled up that um, McKinsey report that yes. was asking for. Thank you. I'm just um, popping that in. I'm popping that in to send to everybody to everybody now. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, who always has my back no matter what. I appreciate that. Um, so, I feel like um, and I think every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I think there was a, a question about some of the other some of the other ones, um, some of the other references as well. They should all be in the they should all be in the slide deck. Um, so, but if there's any issues with that, please do please do get in contact with me, and I can um, I can certainly provide those as well. I think it was the the too much stored data can be expensive slide. They yeah, the, yeah, the, they should yeah. be they should be in the slide deck or or are easily referenced by um, by looking at the um, by looking at the just the um, the name of the organisation that you should be able to to track back through there. But they should be. They should be all in there, definitely. So, oh, if we had, here's a good question. If we had to choose one information management activity to tackle head on and only one, which one would it be? Oh, gosh, that is such an excellent question. Um, oh, what would it be? I, you know what it would be for me is the simplification of retention and disposal schedules because I think that that has the most impact and it has the the most significant amount of flow on for um for so many different things so for example um if we can simplify our retention and disposal schedule we can then also simplify a taxonomy we have less rules to with less rules to manage they're easier to implement there's less impact then on the on the users there's less impact on on how um on the how we actually um apply those rules to to content sources and and things like that so i think if if we're only if we can only pick one which is challenging enough for me as it is that's a great question that's really made me think uh, yeah I think it has to be I think it has to be the simplification of retention and disposal schedules for me so would that would that also be like setting an industry standard across the globe so if you work in a particular industry then one retention and disposal schedule for that industry across globally I think that I mean look that, I think that that, that would be a that would be a dream, but it would be completely impossible. So I worked in a government, I worked in a state government um, early in my career that tried to implement a single um, system across the entire state government. And I, I cannot even tell you the ridiculous the ridiculous questions, I mean, sorry, the ridiculous arguments that, that the different government entities had um, agreeing just simple stuff like what codes should we give each government department you know, so that we can share information and, and things like that. So I think that in theory, that is something that would be really good. But um, in practice, I don't think that, I don't think it works. Um, we do have some other questions. Um, we do have some other questions, but we're needing to, I guess we're really coming, we're really coming to the end of our, our time here. So we won't get to, we won't get to all of those. That is something though that I can certainly, um, I'll, I'll take some of those, take notes of some of those questions and um, try and get some information out on LinkedIn or in some in some follow-up email, or we can definitely address them in the next webinar that we have coming up as well. So, so a great opportunity to join us for that, for that next one, that next one coming up. But um, I'm going to hand it back to Teresa only to say, look, thank you so much for joining us. It's just an absolute privilege to, to talk to you about all of this stuff. I could talk about this for days, obviously, um, uh, but for you to for you to want to join in on that is is just it's just so lovely, and and we really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, thanks to Alyssa Blackburn and Bruce Barons of Avpoint. Um, I've had a fantastic time um, just 
listening to what all you've had to share and and I love those Slido polls. Um, I, thank you. <laughs> and, and thanks to AppPoint for underwriting th uh, this webinar today without the support for, of our solution providers and wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs. So I greatly appreciate AppPoint's um, support of AIM's webinar program. Um, as you see, have up on the, on the screen right now, um, AIM24, we are in maybe a little more than a few months out, and it's in the first week of April of 2024 in San Antonio, Texas. Um, but the website is up, registration is open. We are working to secure keynote speakers and to get a full agenda up. Um, so you're going to know within the next month um, just mo even more of what all we have planned going on. So please put that in your budgets for 2024. Really want to see you come out and join folks like Alyssa and Bruce and how many other solution providers. And more, more importantly, hundreds of your industry peers are going to be there um, for you to network with each other and to so that you can talk with folks like Alyssa and Bruce and um, and even hopefully chat directly with them um, and to ask your questions and, and just to learn. Uh, I love AIM conferences and they're just a fantastic way just to continue your information management learning opportunities. Oh. That does bring things to a wrap. Um, just thank everybody for your time today. Um, for AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you with our next webinar. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So